Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to those at home. Um, before I hand over the service um, to Stuart and Melanie Ellis, I just have a couple of notices. Um, if anybody at home is sat there and they really would like to come to church, then please, please come along. Book in. If you decide on a Sunday morning that you haven't booked in but you still want to come, please, please come along because we've got plenty of spaces. And we can open up the doors so that we can go into the um, other part of the fall to the festival. So nobody would ever be turned away. So that's just a little, not a plea, but please come back to church and come, and come join with our services. Secondly, um, I have some good news just to let everybody know that the licensing of our new vicar, um, Rachel, will be on Thursday the 22nd of July at 7.30. There will be some more details to follow. Um, it's going to be all three churches, so it will include um, Black Knotty and Rain. And anybody who would like to attend, if they could please let Maggie know so that we can keep account on numbers because it needs to be divided fairly between all three churches. That's all from me today, so it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here with you this morning, and although Church is not yet back to normal as we, as we know it. Um, it is lovely to be able to gather in this way to, uh, to worship God uh, together. And so we welcome all of you and all of those who may be watching uh, from home. Today, of course, is Pentecost Sunday. And our call to worship um, reminds us of that. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Renew our lives inside and out. With fire and wind, come to this place, gather us in, and send us out. We're going to uh, watch our first hymn. It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? But uh, you can you can hum along if you like. Uh, we're not allowed to sing out loud as we like to do at the moment, but we can hum along. And this is a, an ancient hymn with a timeless with a timeless meaning. Thank you.
starts almost a prayer in itself, isn't it, that hymn, but nicely leads us into our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. God's Spirit is approaching, through time, across continents, soaring over creation. God's Spirit is speaking, whispering and comforting, roaring and challenging. God's Spirit surrounds us, beyond touch, warmly embracing. God's Spirit transforms us, making our horizons wider, our faith stronger, our hopes possible. Creator God, like a bird, you hovered over the chaos of the world's first day, drawing life from crashing waves and making the world a possibility. You hovered over parting waters, liberating and enslaved people, guiding them forward with cloud and fire, nurturing your followers and sharing your love. Like a still, small voice, you made your presence felt to prophets and healers, to a people in exile, and young mothers to be. In the life of Jesus, your healing touch was felt, and all were made welcome. Like flickering embers dancing into flame, you revived those who looked for you, inspiring their speech and startling onlookers. Undeterred by death, you delivered creative power, transforming determination, and your eternal supporting presence. And your spirit nurtured us still, a gathered people at Pentecost, moved to celebrate, free to be ourselves, glad to meet God and open ourselves to the world around us. Spirit of the living God, move among us as you transform us into the people you invite us to be, as you transform the world into the place you dream it to be. Make us one in love, humble, caring, selfless, sharing. Flow amongst us, Spirit of God, fill us with your courage and care. Breath of life, take us on a journey of love. Amen. And our prayers of confession. Merciful and gracious God, our hearts cry out for you to make us whole again. Even as we celebrate that you have come to dwell within us, we recognise that we have sinned against you and abandoned your commandments. At times we have been jealous, possessive, ambivalent and impulsive. We have not heeded your word, we have not cherished your covenant. So help us to glorify you in all times and in all places, as our souls thirst for your living waters, quench our needs and satisfy our love, that we may come back to you, and be sent forth to fill the world with your mercy and grace. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is at work within us. Amen. Jesus said, as he came amongst them, Peace be with you. And after this he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this to them, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are forgiven. So we hear that word of grace, that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's a long time, isn't it, since any of us have been able to enjoy going to a large event. Um, I can't really constitute this as a large event this morning, but it's probably larger than some of us have known for a while. Pentecost, that festival of celebration in Jerusalem. Let me think about the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit that has been around since the beginning of creation, because it's God's Spirit, God's breath amongst us, and we read about it in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and at this time of Pentecost, we recognise that God came afresh in his Holy Spirit to give power uh, for the disciples to be witnesses, and in that sense we can say today we celebrate the birthday of the Church. 
I don't know if any of you um, have ridden or still ride a bike. I have to say, I no longer have one. But there's always that uh, worry, isn't it? Whether you go out uh, on your bike or whether you go out in the car, that you look out and suddenly uh, you've got a puncture. There are no air, there's no air in the tyre. We had that with Melanie's car just the other, other week. Suddenly we're going out and the tyre was flat and we have to do something about it. You can't drive a car without any air in the tyres. You can't ride a bike without any air in the tyres, albeit the punctures are generally a little easier to, uh, uh, easier, easier to, uh, to deal with. And in the sense, this is uh, what we see in the life of the disciples, isn't it? They needed to have the breath of God within them. They needed to have that new confidence and courage to do all that they had been called to do. We don't have Jesus physically with us today, but he offers us his breath, his Holy Spirit. What I like about the account of that time in Jerusalem that we now call Pentecost, it was a time of great excitement. And Jesus wants us to be excited about him too. And that's what we need to ask the Holy Spirit within us to be. To be excited about God, to share his good news. The good news of the gospel that is not just for us who gather on a Sunday or gather at home. It is indeed good news for the whole earth. We're going to, uh, to listen to a song now. And this is a song called Waymaker. Thank you.
Our reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, and our reading from chapter 2, starting at verse 1. The Holy Spirit came upon Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them all declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. And so as we reflect on that reading, we're going to uh, hear one more song. And uh, perhaps we can imagine ourselves as part of that cry, as part of that celebration, what that might have been like uh, to have felt that sense of transformation of God's spirit as we seek to welcome the Holy Spirit into our own lives. Holy Spirit, we welcome you.
going to um, impress you with my Greek. Actually, I didn't study New Testament Greek at college. Having taken three attempts to uh, pass my German O-level, I did get there in the end. Um, I decided that learning a new language with a different alphabet was definitely not for me. However, the Greek word for 50 is pentikonta. Now, we all know that a pentagon has got five summits and is derived from the Greek words. But enough of that. But it has to be said that it's strange that one of the great mysteries of this Jewish festival of Pentecost um, is that the name is derived from the Greek. You may have wondered about that. Well, I have a bit of a theory about this. It's a complete myth, I'm sure, but anyway, I have a bit of a theory about it. That maybe a Jewish uh, schoolboy was doing his Greek homework one day, a couple of hundred years before the time of Jesus, and must have added up the number of days from the Passover to the next big festival in the Jewish calendar, the, um, the Harvest Festival, or the, the Feast of Weeks, as it uh, used to be known. And perhaps came up with that startling fact that the interval between the two festivals was 50 days. So maybe he was given a school project to uh, come up with a name for what the, uh, the festival called the Greek-speaking people, that they could understand. So why not call it the 50th day, Pentecontra? I imagine his uh, Greek tutor probably jumped out of the bath and shouted, Eureka! Well, maybe not. Hope he didn't run down the road naked. Or perhaps he just uh, was slightly bemused at the poor child's lack of imagination. Well, however the festival got its name, by the time that Jesus came along, the name had stuck. The name Pentecost. But it was, of course, the Jewish Harvest Festival. And coming as it did at the beginning of the summer, it was the ideal time for people to bring the first fruits of their fields and their flocks to the temple and to offer sacrifices uh, for uh, the sins that they had committed during the year and to pray for prosperity for the year to come. To share the benefits of God's goodness with the temple priesthood and the poor um, in a good year, and to express their hope that things would get better in the years that weren't so good. And so as you can probably imagine, they brought their calves and their lambs and their sheaves of wheat and their skins of wine all up to the temple. Some of it was, uh, they converted into cash with the money changers as required by the Jewish law, although Jesus didn't think too much of that, did he? Some of it they gave to the priests as the law commanded, but most of them took it out again to be, uh, to be eaten as a sacrificial and festal meal within the holy city of Jerusalem. More than anything else, Pentecost in Jerusalem in the days of the temple was probably just one big party. <laughs> For some people it would been their annual chance to, uh, uh, to really feast on, on red meat. There would of course been a lot of fruits and vegetables as well, as well as wonderful varieties of breads that were made with all those different grains from the Holy Land. And of course, I can't forget the wine, which would have been in abundance as well. A great party, a national celebration, a celebration that had survived uh, another year in the land in which they had been given by God. And it was a celebration of the wonderful gifts of God's goodness. To be thankful for God's wonderful and abundant and unexpected gifts. It's always good to do that, isn't it? And certainly when Melanie and I lived up in North Yorkshire, 
harvest festivals in the Methodist Church were a, a big, big thing amongst those farming communities. Uh, they were almost the highlight of the year, uh, not to mention the suppers that came afterwards. But a time to be thankful, a time to remember God's great goodness. But Pentecost is also a day for the unexpected. It's a day when things don't quite go according to plan. Jews and Christians for the past 3,000 years or so have celebrated on this day the surprising acts of God. And things didn't go as expected at the Pentecost in the decades after Jesus' time. In fact, they changed out of all recognition. Within less than 50 years, that great Pentecost party was a thing of the past. Why? Because in AD 70, the Romans got sick of the Jews rebelling and being uncooperative and they knocked the temple flat. And they banned all forms of Jewish worship within the city limits of Jerusalem. That made taking the harvest festival offerings up to the temple impossible. They couldn't do it. And so they had to find a different way of doing it. And the emphasis on Pentecost then became a celebration of thanksgiving for the giving of the Torah, God's law and set. And that's what it is in Judaism right down to this day. It's still a celebration. It's a thanksgiving, but more restrained, perhaps more manageable. All sounds very English, doesn't it, in a way? Of course, Christians took Pentecost and made it into something altogether different as well. On the Pentecost, after the first Easter within the city of Jerusalem, there it was filled to capacity with the Jews from every land under the sun, as Melanie read. And the Christians got together to celebrate and to share their Pentecost offerings. It must have made a bit of a din because they attracted attention and people thought that they were a mob of drunks who had got a little bit out of hand. And then what happened was suddenly, unexpectedly, they found the words, they found the strengths, they found the courage, they found the inspiration to share the message of Jesus. And why? Because the promise of the Spirit in that new and fresh way that Jesus had predicted and promised, had become real. The Spirit of God had come upon them. It had moved their hearts. They were on fire for God. Nothing was going to be bold too bold for them. No, nothing was going to hold them back. They were inspired to speak, to witness, to act in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit that proceeds from the Father and the Son as we recite in the Creed. There's going to be no more hiding behind locked doors for this lot. They've come out and are ready to take on all comers. They had the right words to say to touch everyone's hearts. They had good news to share. And there was no stopping them from sharing it. They laughed, they danced, they sang, they set the world on fire. And what was their message? Well, it was a very simple one Jesus lives, Jesus is Lord. Death has been defeated. Life has begun. Of course, there were lots of problems as they went on, lots of opposition, but it didn't stop them. They carried on because they knew that the message of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, was the salvation for all. Pentecost, the 50th day, a day for celebrating the generosity, the unexpectedness of God. The strengthening the empowering, the enlightening, the comforting, the healing, the inflaming, the intoxicating spirit of God, which enables us to share the gospel. When we don't have the words, when we do not speak the language, when we do not have anything in common with those who we witness to. The disciples just had to be available. God's spirit did the rest. But you might be thinking as you're sitting here this morning or at home, that's all very well, Stuart, I hear you say, but we're not sure where we are and who we are now in the midst of this global pandemic. And I guess that's a fair comment to make. And it's true on this day when we celebrate the birthday of the church. What is there to celebrate, to look forward to? Certainly that's the comments that some people will make. And of course, these last 18 months have been unlike anything that we have ever known in our lifetime. The concept of church as being closed, whether big or small, for months on end would have been unimaginable, wouldn't it, a couple of years ago. And now we wonder whether people will return to churches, or whether as an institution it will be 
further away from the consciousness of the general population. And at this stage, we just don't know. But what I do know is that the Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the answer to our deepest needs. He is our salvation. And the Christian faith, the story of redemption, of crucifixion, of resurrection, of death, of victory, and the promise of fullness of life, indeed eternal life, is as much needed in our world today as ever. However, we need to seek the Holy Spirit to communicate and reach out in new ways, even though we don't necessarily have the know-how or the language. Many churches, including yours here, have learned how to reach out online. More people have watched online services than have ever darkened the doors of church buildings. Services have been available on demand rather than an, in an hour's slot on a Sunday morning. We've learned to do things differently, as has the world at large. I was listening to uh, Nicky Gumbel, who I'm sure you'll be aware of, as the, um, the director of um, Holy Trinity Brompton and uh, uh, founder of the Alpha Movement, and he was saying that he never thought that Alpha would work online. But you know, they've had more people in being involved in exploring the Christian faith through Alpha online than they've ever had come into churches on invitation. It's the way that works, it's the way of the world, whether you like it or not. But we also know that the church needs to be there for its pastoral care of the most vulnerable, the elderly, the disadvantaged, the lonely, the bereaved. That will continue to be a core part of our mission. I've been very struck by the passage in Isaiah chapter 43 these last few weeks. I want to read a few of the verses to you. It's entitled Israel's Only Saviour. But this is what the Lord says, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who was called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lead out those who are, have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold us to proclaim this to the former things? Let them bring in their witness to prove that they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there ever be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no saviour. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. The, the Israelites were to be delivered to a new from a, um, to a new exodus from the Babylonians following a period of exile. God assures them of his presence, his love, his redemption. Putting that into New Testament times, God has given himself in his son Jesus for us and for our salvation. We are made for God's glory, made in and reflect his image and nature. Israel, the, the people of God, were to lead out those who had blind eyes and deaf ears to be God's witnesses and bring others to faith in him. Isaiah reminds the people of God of his almighty power in their, in their history. 
the parting of the Red Sea, the deliverance from the Egyptians. And God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. That comes a little later in that passage. The COVID-19 pandemic has drawn a line in the world's sands, hasn't it? Life will never go back to how it was before in many ways, whether it's people's working arrangements or practices, whether it's about travel or the high street. The list is long. But with any crisis, there is always an opportunity. In a few months' time, Ellen and I are moving to uh, Nottinghamshire, to Mansfield, where I'm going to be the superintendent minister of 12 churches in that area after 11 years here in Essex in educational leadership. Some people think I'm a bit daft. Well, it might be. The group of churches that uh, we are overseeing um, are somewhat bewildered at the moment about what the future holds. And do I have the answers? No, of course I don't. But I do believe that God is with us at all times. I do know that despite the ups and downs of church history, the church has remained for over 2,000 years, and that God is alive by his spirit in the lives of his people and in the world. Today we celebrate the coming of the Spirit, the birth, the birthday of the church at Pentecost. My job is not to worry about whether the church is big or small, popular or unpopular. Throughout its history it's been all of those things. My calling as a Christian is to draw close to God, to follow his way, to be open to the promptings and enabling of the Holy Spirit, and to reach out to those who need to hear and experience the good news of Jesus Christ. Now that's challenging and it's exciting. It's challenging to unselfishly let go of those things that perhaps we need to let go of, that are no longer communicating or enabling people to develop as Christ's disciples. But it's exciting to embrace, to embrace what we might never have imagined, the new things that God wants to do amongst us. And so my question to you this morning is, will you embrace, as that previous song acted as a prayer for, will you embrace the Holy Spirit in greater measure in your lives, in your church, so that God's will may be done in you and through you and in you and bring to others the experience of God's love in Christ so that they might put their faith in him. Today we pray, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And we're going to listen to that song, which I'm sure will be familiar to you. And uh, may you use that as your prayer, as I shall use it as my prayer this morning, to seek God's Holy Spirit in greater measure. Thank you.
come now to our prayers of intercession to share, share together. And there is a response this morning. After the words, Lord, your spirit is with us, can we say together, Hail. Hey, so we come together in prayer. Loving God, this morning we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us to pray. Come, Holy Spirit, get the rulers of the world. Fill our leaders with talents and discernment to seek the common good. And particularly at this time we pray when the world needs to act as one. We ask for your energy and vision for those who are tiring in the battle against injustice and oppression. Those who feel exhausted by the struggle with poverty and hunger. Give them a fresh impetus for their work and mission. Spirit of God, show us all how to bring peace and justice and unity to the nations. Lord, your spirit is with us. Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, fill our homes and set our hearts on fire with the warmth of your love. Inspire us to new beginnings. Help us as part of your universal and local church to reach out to others with the good news of Christ, to bring hope to those in distress. May we be open to new ways of operating, recognising that your gospel is timeless and your love is endless. Lord, your spirit was with us. Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, we come this morning to you for those who are eaten up with guilt and anxiety, for those who the Christian life is hard and dry. We bring to you the despairing, despondent, those who are uncertain how to use their time or money, or are tempted to do wrong. May they have your guidance and your strength. We pray for all those who are weak, for those who are ill, for those who are recovering from the surgery. And this morning we especially bring to you, Lord, Jennifer Warboys and Alan Waters, who are recovering. May your love surround them and your healing grace be with them. We pray for those who cannot cope on their own, those who are struggling with their mental health, those who feel socially isolated, those who are bereaved, and any more known to us, and particularly in need of trouble, who, who need our prayers this morning, Lord, we bring them to you in the quietness. Spirit of God, may they know your hope and your comfort. May they know your power and your assurance. Lord, your Spirit is with us. Hear yeah. our prayer. Holy Spirit, create new life in your people and renew and refresh us as we turn in obedience and in faith to you. And we conclude our prayers with the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final uh, song is one that 
reminds us of our faith and, and the creed, and it's called This I Believe. We come to the 
conclusion of our service, I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able to as we receive God's blessing. And so may the Spirit who hovered over the waters when the world was created breathe into you the life he gives. May the Spirit who set the church on fire upon the day of Pentecost bring the world alive with the love of the risen Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.